I'm very defiant online against uses of AI art and mm. replacing people who make their livelihood from this creativity. I mean, there's also, if you're a religious person, a lot of religions have prohibitions against things like theft and AI art and AI text generation are dependent, we're seeing increasingly, uh, on the theft correct. of other people's intellectual property. So you should be questioning, you know, the use of these technologies. Attention all citizens of the future. Buckle up and step into our time tunnel of imagination to join us on an extraordinary journey into the days of futures past. We'll unearth those tantalizing portrayals of the future and beyond that captured imaginations in their time. Join me as we embark on exploring those futures we were promised but which never arrived. So let's go to our guide that excavator of the eventual, that historian of the hereafter, that recorder of retro futures, Theo Priestley. Hello and welcome to another episode of Days of Futures Past where I talk with a guest about what inspired them from the past, um, their childhood, the science fiction that they read or watched, um, and also just uh, discuss what the hot topics are of the day. Today I have with me Professor Dr. Beth Singler, who is the Assistant Professor in Digital Religions at the University of Zurich, joining from the University of Cambridge, where she was the Junior Research Fellow in Artificial Intelligence. Her academic career at Cambridge spans 15 years, and in 2021, she was elected a Fellow of the International Society for Science and Religion, and has won awards for her research and public engagement on the work on AI ethics. Beth, Thank Hello. you for joining me. Thank you for having me here. Thank you. So what's it like in Zurich just now? Oh, it's very windy. Uh, and es ist windig. I'm practicing my German. It's uh, sehr windig. Yeah, it's um, yeah, just trees and leaves blowing about. But I think the UK has had it a lot worse recently, so I can't complain too much. Yes, I still feel a bit battered and bruised, and I think my garden's an absolute mess outside. Although the cat, the, the cats are slightly freaked as well because the okay. cat flap is kind of like doing this, and they don't know what to make <laughs> of it. Um, so your background in AI and obviously ethics and religion is is it's quite a bit of a heady mix. How did you get into that? Yeah how how do you how do you get from where <laughs> I was to where I am? I'm not really sure. So uh, I suppose it comes down to, for me to stories. Uh, I've always been someone who has been obsessed with reading and watching stories. And then when it came to thinking about where I wanted to go with my career, it was around focusing on the stories that we tell ourselves about how the world works and what it's going to be like. Now, I'm sure there's some people who won't necessarily like that I describe religion as a story, but that's how I approach it as an anthropologist. And uh, so through my academic studies, I started looking at contemporary stories we were telling ourselves, the new religions that were emerging around technology, the spaces in which people were finding to share their stories with each other, so online religious movements. And then it wasn't until about 2016, after I'd finished my PhD, where I'd looked broadly at the New Age movement and some of the stories and ideas that were in that, that I uh, moved into a postdoc position that was specifically on our understanding of artificial intelligence and where we think it's going. And there was a sort of religious element to that. The uh, the institute I was working at was uh, the Faraday Institute for Science and Religion, and they were interested in that conversation between science and religion. And then I was specifically looking at artificial intelligence, both how people are using artificial intelligence for their religious practices and their religious environments, but also my particular interest in new religious movements and how how people describe AI in religious terms, how yeah. they start to see it as godlike or having some of the attributes that are worthy of worship in particular ways and the exponential language that comes out in artificial intelligence quite often. We've seen AI or certainly chatbots and chat GPT being used as ser in sermons, for example, just okay. now. I mean, yeah. do you see that becoming more prolific, um, certainly by the church or even by other people who want to experience religion in a, in a completely different way? Yeah, I think you, you can kind of separate out some of these more performative moment movement sorry, performative moments from the wider cultural shift we're seeing of uh, people adopting AI as an assistant in their day-to-day -day tasks. Yeah. Now 
even though religions involve a sort of, you know, spiritual moments, there are lots of more mundane activities of an institution that happen for religion. So, you know, using Excel spreadsheets or writing documents. And just as any other corporation or business is thinking about how AI can be an assistant in that, so religions are doing as well. So you get these two elements, people thinking about how AI might help them with spiritual work and then people also using it in day to day work. So I don't see necessarily um, that the second will disappear. People are encouraged to use artificial intelligence to be efficient. But there is a lot of debate about whether these AI sermons really encapsulate the spirituality and mm. the collective experience that people want to have in a religious environment. Um, I mean, there's lots of different examples of people just feeling that they can use it for a starting point in writing a sermon, but they feel like they have to come along and add some of the emotion that is required for that. I think in previous conversations that we've had, I think that the human side and the human element and the context and the emotion and the empathy mm -hmm. is certainly a, a topic that crops up often in conversations around AI. Mm -hmm. um, and from an ethical point of view, I mean, do you think that there should be this kind of sort of separation between this is what humans can do and mm -hmm. AI shouldn't be able to replicate empathy and uh, you know mm. or, or try to replicate empathy and emotion and you know an understanding because we need that kind of demarcation line as to what ai yeah. is yeah there is a sort of growing shift towards humo human centrism you know what what is essential to the human that we want to protect i'm very defiant online against uses of ai art and mm. replacing people who make their livelihood from this creativity I mean, there's also, if you're a religious person, a lot of religions have prohibitions against things like theft and AI art and AI text generation are dependent, we're seeing increasingly, yeah. on the theft of other people's intellectual property. So you should be questioning, you know, the use of these technologies. And the demarcation of what we think it means to be human is an ongoing conversation and perhaps art and creativity are one of the characteristics that we would want to protect. Um, so yeah, it's becoming a bit of a vociferous conversation it's quite <laughs> tense in some places online because if again if you're someone like me who can't draw for toffee it's exciting the idea that now i can manifest the images in my head by just writing a few lines of prompt but should you be doing that yeah it's a difficult one i try not to i've been tempted a few times yeah well yeah i mean when you understand how it's been trained and whose work it, it's actually yeah. been used against then it, it, yeah, you, you kind of wish you could just go back to dr drawing the crayons again and, and actually learn yourself yeah. and how to do it. Um, yeah. Touching on, I guess, keeping on the theme of sort of religion and AI then, is, is you know, do you see that there are going to be religious movements based on, you know, artificial intelligence itself, not so much the, being the use in um, mm. sermons and helping, um, you know, the organisational side of things, but people worshipping AI. Uh, you yeah. know, we have seen some, there has been a couple of movements in the past Yeah, there's a few this. that have had a bit more press attention than others. You may have heard of The Way of the Future. Mm -hmm. it came from Anthony Lewandowski, who is a significant figure in the sort of tech field for one or two reasons. Yeah, there's, there's the Turing Church. They've been around for a while. I mean, they were holding ceremonies back in World of Warcraft. So there's Terrasem, which is sort of partially based on Earthseed, which is a religion from the books of Olivia Butler, the science fiction novels. There's a few groups of Theta Noir, um, New Order Technoism. They, they emerge. I mean, there's always a question when you're studying new religious movements or it's a question from other people more, is how significant are these groups? Mm. Uh, a lot of people will tell me, well, why, why are you studying them? Because they're not serious, right? They've just emerged in the last couple of years or they're focused on science fiction. So I also have written about Jediism and Scientology and these groups find their inspiration in science fiction or fantasy. They they intentionally construct what they want to exist. Yeah. Uh, and for some people, that's not what religion is. Religion should come from some form of supernatural revelation, some events quite often a long time ago. And the length of the duration of a religion sometimes gives it this sense of legitimation. If it's been around for 2000 years, it's just more serious than something that turned up two weeks ago. Mm. Um, I don't see that as an anthropologist because I think it's about the inherent nature of what people are trying to create and nature of humanity that it's 
continuously seeks these ways of expressing its spirituality. Um, I don't see them as any less serious, but that's perhaps a, a controversial position for some people who are saying, no, absolutely not. This is parody. Some are intentionally parody religions as well, like Discordianism or the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster, <laughs> that people you know go out of their way to do performance and play. Uh, and for some people, they just sort of dismiss that. But I think, yeah, absolutely. We see groups focused on artificial intelligence, whether they hang around, whether they grow, whether we get a larger church of AI in some format. Who knows? Is, is there a, a, an obvious difference between what I would say is religion and what I would call a cult then? Mm. It's a long history <laughs> of discussions about these terms, and I'll, quite, I'll keep it as brief as possible. So, yeah, the term cult, when it emerges in the sociology of religion back sort of in the 1920s, is meant to be an objective academic term. It's just another way of demarking between a larger denomination, a church, a sect, a cult. These are all just different terms. And then, you know, over, over the decades, it becomes this much more pejorative term because some of these new religious movements, they scared people. There were moral yeah. panics about the arrival of the Unification Church to America and this idea that all the teenagers were becoming hippies and dropping out and joining some of these groups. Now, that's not to say there are not specific examples of harm when it comes to new religious movements, the Jonestown Massacre, the Amshin Rinko, um, a sarin gas attack in Tokyo. There are specific terrible things that have happened you could say that more broadly about other religions mm -hmm. as well um it and then obviously the cult becomes this very negative term so academics tend to talk about new religious movements because it doesn't come with so much of that ba baggage around what a cult is and what it does um, and that doesn't mean that academics don't point out those harms they're very keen to recognize there are abuses and to make those visible to people but it's just it doesn't come with that prejudice straight away when you start describing a new group. Mm. Now, you were born in the 80s, a oh. child of the 80s, um, which, <laughs> which uh, is again, me, thank you. <laughs> and, um, and, and, yeah, and uh, like I said on another podcast, you know, to me, the 80s was a great decade, or I certainly have very fond memories of, okay. of a lot of it in, in terms of cultural side of things. I mean, when you were growing up, you know, what were the kind of things that you were seeing? like sort of really stayed with you um, yeah, yeah and, and you've carried through to your career today. Well, I do, I do get asked about where my interest in AI comes from and I will always say I'm an unrepentant geek. Like I, I probably did have a period of shame in my teenage years where I stopped playing Dungeons and Dragons and I stopped talking about all the science fiction films and TV that I love, but now I'm like, oh, blow it, bring it on. I'll talk about everything. Um, so for the, for me in the 80s and then 90s as more of a teenager, uh, it was a lot of Star Trek Next Generation that shaped my thinking specifically around AI with Lieutenant Commander Data. Mm. Crush on Brent Spiner Boy. never went away. Uh, but just the, the way in which the 80s and 90s started giving us these narratives of AI as a way into the conversation about what it means to be human. So there were several films like uh, Daryl, which is an acronym. I won't remember what the, the letters stand for. Uh, Batteries Not Included, Short Circuits, uh, War Games. They were all stories about how reflecting on the AI moment gets us into conversations about what it means to be human. What What is a good force in the world? Can, a, can an AI or a robot be one of these things that teaches us how to be better humans? What does that interaction with the non-human other bring to our sense of the self? And mm. I think that's a bit of a sea change to the earlier science fiction, which was much more straight down the line dystopian. You know, building on Carol Chepek's RUR for in the 1920s, a lot of stories about robots were just they're going to go run amok and we're going to have the dystopia and the apocalypse. And there's still lots of that now. I mean, I'm also a huge fan of uh, the Terminator series and that came out, that started in the 80s as well. But I think it, there were these few instances of more kind of fantastical stories, almost magical stories of what would it mean to encounter another life form that's synthetic in some way? Mm -hmm. And what does that tell us about ourselves? And what can we disrupt about our assumptions about where humanity is going? So I'm kind of obsessed with that kind of that era of AI and robot films. And some people will be like, well, well you know, what's your favorite AI film? Expecting me probably to say something that's considered more high culture like ex machina and i'll say short circuit <laughs> not just being glass i'm like oh she's not as smart as we thought she was <laughs> but touching on um so 
Star Trek. I mean, I the next gen, especially the next generation. Um, I mean, if you look back at um, the original series, yeah. um, you had uh, what are little girls made of, which was uh, you know another classic episode where you had. Um, well, no, would they be considered androids? They were essentially people transferred into ro- robotic bodies and then and, discovering that they weren't actually human at all, even though they believed that they were human. Um, yeah. And then you had The Measure of a Man, which oh, I think is an absolutely one of my favorites, corking yeah. episode, which Amazing. essentially puts Data on trial as, yeah. as, as whether he is a, a, a thing or a property of the Federation to be mm-hmm. dealt with as, as they see fit. I mean, do, do you see... Us coming across that kind of dilemma, um, you know, in the near future, in the next sort of like I don't know, uh, 20, 30, 40 years, where yeah. we have to consider that there could be something like robot rights. That, yeah, that we have I mean, to... the conversation's strong and vibrant now. Uh, you don't have to get into the near future. And I generally, on the question of personhood and other basically religious questions, I will take a, lo- a strong agnostic position when it comes to AI and robots. And say, well, I don't in particular hold a position, but I can tell you what these other people say. So we've already had figures like Blake Lemoyne, the Google engineer who uh, got Mm. into trouble for saying that Lambda, the chatbot he was working with, was basically a person was conscious. Uh, And yeah, there's a little giggle there. A few people laughed about that. But that's the state we're at when we have something like Lambda or OpenAI's uh, chat GPC that is specifically designed to be a conversational partner. It doesn't have to do all the other things that Commander Data could do. You know, yeah. remember he was fully functional. He doesn't have to be a full <laughs> Android. It can be a chatbot that convinces you, or even just a very simple bot on Twitter that people interact with. And I see men, fl- men and women probably, but men flirting with chatbots on Twitter that are not going to respond in the way that they're expecting because they think that's another person. So it doesn't take very much for us to slip into this anthropomorphization yeah. and see consciousness already here in large language models like ChatGPT. Um, so that conversation's already here, the question about robot rights. And of course, science fiction feeds into that. Um, very obviously demarcated as science fiction when it's presented, but TV series like Humans open up that question of what that future would look like. So people are encouraged into having those conversations already. So no, it wouldn't be the far future it is now. We are already talking about robot rights. If you look back, you know, further back from the 80s, for example, yeah. and you had the 50s and the 60s where robots were obviously infused with some kind of intelligence, but they were very restricted in particular roles. So you had oh. robots in the house that did chores and you had robots in shops and things like that. I yeah. mean, that was, that was, you know, again, you had that demarcation line where they, they are seen as um, tools. Okay. Um, and should we then rather than try to push forwards towards a situation where we have to consider robot rights and and they, and they have that intellect to, to be able to make decisions for themselves or be fully yeah. autonomous, um, should we actually start to consider, well, actually, we, we need to draw a line in the sand that a robot, robot mm-hmm. or certainly AI should be still considered as a tool and we shouldn't give it all these abilities. Yeah, I mean, that's a very strong argument from some people in the kind of broadly AI ethics robot rights area. So Joanna Bryson is a, a technologist and philosopher, and she's written papers, type, one of them titled, I think, AI should just be tools, or I think mm. she had a previous version where she said even just slaves, like actually specific narrow tasks only, we should never have this conversation. But the problem is that slippage towards anthropomorphism that we all have a tendency towards, even if you specified AI or robotic forms to very limited tasks, people still form packed bonds with them. Like we have this tendency to ascribe personhood to things and entities long before they have any kind of interactivity. It's just that AI enhances that to a certain degree. Um, but all, I mean, I, I remember visiting a lab in Cambridge where they were working on various different uh, robotic arms and exoskeletons and things like that. And someone had uh, put googly eyes on one of the robotic arms and given it a name with a sign. Like we adopt <laughs> technology so quickly that it's very hard to control that tendency. Um, and as I said, even the simplest of bots on Twitter, which really don't have any kind of machine learning, they're just spewing out content, mm. will be interacted with as though this is another person. I say this in in a couple of different things, but 
humans fail the Turing test all the time. Not that we mistake humans for uh, non-humans, but actually human interlocutors, the ones who are questioning the personhood and the sentience of the other entity, are the ones who fail the Turing test. We make mistakes all the time. Even when, as in Ex Machina, you can see the insides, that's the Garland test, mm. knowing that it, you can see the insides of the robot and still think it's got consciousness, that's a passing of the train test. But I think, you know, my reverse Garland test is that the humans are failing that test and seeing personhood where it isn't sometimes as well. So, yeah, we've got this complicated network of kinship and attribution that is so hard to control. We won't necessarily be able to stop that from happening. You mentioned uh, an interesting word, which is slave. Mm. Um, and I remember reading something, and I'm sure it was um, dated from the 60s, mm. um, where it specifically said that robots would be slaves to, to humanity. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, you know, is that the correct way of, of looking at it? Because, I, you know, yeah. there's, there's a lot of moral issues around the use of that word, and obviously... You know, where where that word has been born from and how yeah. humanity is, uh, you know has come from from yeah. where it was before treating slavery. I mean, should we see robots or, or AIs as slaves? Or, or I, uh, I think I wrote a piece specifically on that article that you're talking about. I, I wrote something for the conversation about how humans dream of electric slaves, basically. Uh, um, and I, if I remember the article you're referring to, the the one from the fifties or the sixties in particular. The account it gives of the kind of dream robot slave is actually using names and language from actual slavery uh. in, in historical slavery. So uh, the robot, I think, robot butler's called Bojangles, which is a reference to slavery and, and chains and just awful things. Yeah, it's, it's it comes with so much emotional baggage, but it also comes with assumptions about how we will treat the non-human other leaving open that question of personhood as I am as an agnostic person on the subject, if we start from that point and something like consciousness emerges, then we're setting up a relationship that's highly problematic and very mm. detrimental to us as well as the, the entities we're engaging with. Uh, I mean, there's people who like to use the metaphor of alien intelligence when talking about artificial intelligence and actually say this is a, as close as we might get to encountering an extraterrestrial life form by creating it here on Earth. And our narratives about engaging with aliens, life forms are similarly problematic. So why are we transposing those onto artificial intelligence as well? Mm. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a whole difficult area because our narratives are so powerful. The stories we tell ourselves about AI are so powerful. We need to be thinking about which ones we think are acceptable now, and which ones aren't. And historically, our encounters with other intelligences have gone so poorly um, even, even you know, our encounters with female intelligence, mm. historically, not to mention, obviously, <laughs> indigenous cultures. So we, we need to be thinking about where we're heading with this and having those conversations. But really, the main conversation at the moment is just, can AI make us more efficient? Let's rush mm. to that. Mm. Do, do you think that we miss a bit of the, because um, you mentioned dystopian, uh, um, you know, uh, visions and, 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 and the tendency to look at the, the negative side of things. Do you think we miss some of the um, utopian or certainly the more positive aspects of, of dreaming up futures from the past? Because, I mean, if you look at back in the 50s and the 60s, it was even though it was a very sort of driven by the atomic age, yeah. everything had a positive spin to it. You know, society was better for it. Our personal lives were better for it. Our home life was better for it. Yeah. Now, all we just seem to think about is, oh, well, this is actually going to drag us down to a different level and it's not going to be good for us. I mean... In. How do we get out of that kind of sort of dystopian thinking, If you do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I counter that and say there are some very strongly utopian voices out there that are really driving some of the public policy conversation. Um, I mean, I even remember Boris Johnson's, this was a little while ago, his speech to the UN about the future of AI, where he made these strongly distinct dystopian and utopian accounts posited ultimately that we would end up with the utopian future of being protected for and cared for by robots of particular kind. Mm. So there is there is this overall view of a kind of techno-determinist, techno-utopian future that infuses a lot of public policy with the development. I know uh, Cummings is no longer such a big figure in the UK. Well, he might be behind the scenes if you, mm. if you listen to stories about what Rishi Sunak has been up to. 
But there was this very strong uh, techno-determinist branch of thinking in the government around the time of Boris Johnson and potentially now as well. I'm very UK focused, even though I'm in Switzerland. I'm still very focused on UK politics. Um, and, you know, ARIA, the kind of UK uh, equivalent of DARPA that has been developed and focus on where we're going with frontier models and the reification and almost near you know, worship of some of these tech leaders like Zuckerberg mm. and the voices that are saying things like Elon Musk is saying that we're all going to merge with machines. There's a strong transhumanist utopian through line in a lot of the main top level conversations about AI that it's all going to solve things for us. But I think we do, I agree with you, I do think we have a tendency towards dystopianism, partially because you can't have science fiction accounts without dystopia. You can't have a story happen without problems and tensions. Mm. So yeah, I mentioned Terminator earlier, and this is the year of Terminator. We're in an anniversary year. It's the 40 years since the first film came out. And I think we should you know, recognize that there is this still this desire from audiences to hear these more disturbing robo-apocalypse accounts as well. Well, people love conflict, don't they, in oh, yeah. stories. I mean, no, nobody's going to go to a film or, or read a book that's just absolutely happy all the way through. And it's just like, yeah. well, what, what happened? <laughs> yeah. Everybody was happy. I don't understand. Um, so apart from, you know, so aside from Star Trek and, you know, Short Circuit and Barry's Didn't. Not Included, was there anything else that you kind of like, that really sort of stuck out for you, you know, in childhood? So I think the other, I mean, my, my main field is artificial intelligence and robots, but I've always had a hankering for teleportation. It's not something you can particularly, oh, that's an interesting question. Could I study the concept of teleportation from an anthropological perspective? Yeah, I think it's doable. But I, I mean, in terms of science fiction and the kind of accounts that affected me, again, it kind of has its roots in Star Trek, the old beam me up Scotty. Right? Uh, you know, he never said that, is that right? Am no, I, he didn't. Right? I'm thinking that's apocryphal, but I do like yeah. it. Uh, and then obviously, as I'm more of a Star Trek next generation girl, that kind of the story is built around the problems that can happen when you replicate someone and beam them across space and resurrect them. So there's that wonderful story, I forget the name of the episode, where they discover that Riker at some point was cloned accidentally. That's right, yeah. Yeah, so there's there's the main Riker who's carried on with the ship and there's the Riker who's been left behind. And there's a, there's a few philosophers of mind I know uh, who every time I mention my love of teleportation, they'll just say, well, it's just death, right? Because if you have to break down the body and replicate it somewhere else, it's not the same person anymore. The mind is gone. And, you know, so you get these questions about mind-body dualism. How, mm. how does the person exist? Do we exist? In the sum of our parts, is it a materialist interpretation? So there's all the kind of philosophical questions. But I just love the idea of being able to go wherever I want, whenever I want, and not being stuck in an airport as I was. I came back from a conference in November and I had to stay. It sounds lovely, but it was awful. A, a day in New York because I missed my flight by five minutes. Right. Delays. And I was just stuck mostly in the airport JFK. And I was just like, if I could click my fingers and just go home wouldn't that be fantastic or go mm. visit the pyramids of egypt or go you know see the great wall of china and just instantaneously so i've always had a, a love of narratives that deal with teleportation although some of them are absolutely terrifying so as i was talking about the the issues stephen king's short story the jaunt haunts me it's a story about teleportation he's not necessarily known as a science fiction author but it's a horror story as well about what happens when Oh dear! Even thinking about it, I get I get shivers. Um, so you have a family who are about to be teleported across space as a part of. I think they're going on a family holidays in the mm. future, um, and the father is telling the children the story of the invention of teleportation and how it works, and that the inventor discovered that the mind and body travel at different times. The body goes instantaneously, but the mind takes an almost infinite amount of time to travel. So everyone has to be anaesthetized before they travel. Otherwise, they go completely like almost like Lovecraftian insane, right. um, except one of the children decides to hold their breath when they're anesthetized. And it's awful. I oh, it. no. It. But, yes, that, that image of teleportation is called the jaunt. If you want to terrorize yourself, King is one of my absolute favorite authors. And he's just so skillful at raising these questions that are oh, terrible, awful. But if I could do it without going insane or more insane. I would, I would enjoy the ability to teleport very much. And, um, you know, we keep getting these promises in science fiction that it might be coming. But 
I don't think technologically wise anyone's really figured it out apart from a teleporting subatomic particles is mm. potentially possible at the quantum level, but that's way above my pay grade. I don't understand that stuff. I know when I read um, the physics of Star Trek a long yeah. time ago, um, it did discuss the fact that, you know, you destroy the original um, and you create a copy. Yeah. But then uh, obviously by teleporting yourself back again, you're destroying the copy and creating yeah. another copy. And then yeah. you essentially, which, you know, which copy are you? You know, yeah. which is quite interesting. I think yeah. the other thing as well was that, um, you, so you mentioned Riker. There was another okay. Star Trek episode um, with um, that Scotty was basically held in the in the transporter yeah. buffer yeah. and then resurrected in a sense. You know, that that's another one where you think to yourself, well, if it goes wrong, I've got a copy, I've got a backup stuck somewhere else, kind yeah. of thing. But how do you, how you know, how do you account for the consciousness side of things? And that, that's, that's it. The... Again, it's the big questions that these sort of speculations on technology inspire us to. Where does consciousness lie? If you have a more holistic account of the universe, then it's like sort of a pan psychism that the consciousness is everywhere mm. anyway. So having it not necessarily embedded in the body, if you're a very strong mind body dualist, which actually quite a lot of people in the AI conversation are, because you have to have a sense that the mind can be separate to the physical body to understand that minds can appear in other substrates like silicon chips, right? Mm. So a lot of people around AI tend to be strong mind-body dualists. And then, of course, there's religious responses that say there's something like a soul or a spirit or an admin, you know, depending on your religious tradition that says that thing is non-destructible. It could return to the body. You choose, if you're a believer in reincarnation, you choose where your soul or spirit goes to. So why not? see it as like a more sh shortened reincarnation if the body is destroyed and resurrected where you just pop back to your body don't you mm. so that's fine so lots of different ways of thinking about it which i find fascinating what are you working on just now then i'm finishing a book <laughs> my publisher will be pleased <laughs> but i am allegedly <laughs> finishing a book uh it's a little bit late uh it's, it's it's an academic book but hopefully accessible to a wider audience if they're interested but it will probably come at academic prices which is the shame mm. um so it's it's a broad book on religion and artificial intelligence covering many different case studies of the relationship and entanglements of religion and ai i'm also looking at transhumanism ai new religious movements post-humanism is in some ways a bit of a summary of everything i've been up to since i started looking more specifically at ai would you go uh, full on transhuman? Would you start having chips in your head and things like that? Wow, having written about it so much lately, the argument is that we're all a little bit transhuman because I don't know, <laughs> I can see you're wearing glasses. I do wear glasses. Yeah. I have lenses in at the moment. You know, the argument being we're all enhancing ourselves with technology all the way back to the emergence of cooked food, right? The technology of cooking food and ingesting us, may, um, ingesting it, it's not ingesting us, uh, made us transhuman in some way. But no, I don't know. I mean, I, I see the... The religious patterns in transhumanist discourse so in some ways it's very familiar that we always had these ideas about how to improve the human or to depart to a heavenly realm by either digital or spiritual uploading so there's mm. a lot of familiarity in that but i don't as i say i tend to tend to class myself as an agnostic so i'm probably quite agnostic also on the claims of transhumanists and where we're going do you have any robots in the home like a little roomba or something like that <laughs> kicking around well, we made uh, a few years back now, we made a series of short films, me and a team of filmmakers and, and some other people involved. And uh, we had Harry the Rumba, who was a recurring character in these short films. Right. So for a period of time, Harry the Rumba was hanging around. But no, I don't have a lot of robots at home. I do have a toy robot army, which uh, on my various forms of social media sometimes make an appearance. They have winter hats. They sometimes appear in when the weather <laughs> changes. There's an Easter selection of eggs like hang out around them. Um, so, no, I don't have a lot of actual robots. So people assume I will do. So I get lots of requests. Go, can you do a talk and can you bring your, all your robots? And I'm like, well, you know, if you want me with my little toy of K2SO or my <laughs> little uh, Funko Pop Lieutenant Commander Data, I can come with those, but I don't have a lot of robots. I don't think people understand, because again, because of all the science fiction narratives and the hype from people like Elon Musk, actually owning an actual robot, like a fully functional, responsive machine learning based robot, is really expensive and difficult. Mm. They, they are prototypes at the moment. The fact that Musk thinks we're all going to own a home robot in a couple of years that he's you know, going to charge about $20,000 for is a remarkable claim. If he pulls it off, there's some things he's claimed he's going to do before he hasn't managed to do. So we'll see. But no, a lot of people don't have the capability apart from the Roomba, really, 
well, my dishwasher. We can have the argument about what well, constitutes a robot as well, because I have a dishwasher. I'm a bit wor- more worried about the fact that if they start putting chat GPT or LLMs into everything, mm. your dishwasher is going to start making comments about the state of the food. <laughs> you know, well, what kind of food do you call this? I wouldn't eat that slow. Get that oh, out of yeah. my... I, I could see that as an optional download, like you can get for Alexa to change personalities. I mm. think some people might enjoy having someone nagging them. I think that's there's some very excellent scholars like Kate Devlin who've pointed out the gender of a lot of these mm. uh, assistants and theoretically the home-based AI assistants. That it's like you know employing a nanny or a mother figure for some people who haven't got that in their lives or haven't got a girlfriend or a wife or a partner. And it's very specifically the gender relationship that seems to be coming out in the performance of these AI assistants. So that's a concern as well. I don't think I really need someone to nag me. (laughs) I'm sure other people do. Well, maybe they can nag you every time you try. You you want to finish the book. They'll just keep you pushing you along. You you can have have like a a nagging editor AI. I'm very good at doing that. But I think, yeah, I think maybe um, that might be a service that people require to have something on their phone. But I have Duolingo, which you know is increasingly AI focused as well. But Duolingo pops up with notifications so regularly that darn owls, like you haven't practiced today. Come on. <laughs> Sorry, I'm in trouble. Um, Bess, when, where can people find more, more about you and, and your work and, and what you're up to? Well, along with being an unrepentant geek, I'm a huge, well, let's call it X Twitter, Twitterholic. So I'm always on social media. Uh, I have a website where you can find previous press media things as well as my rather more serious academic work. Uh, basically, I'm very Googleable, and I live in Zurich, so it also can find me there. Beth, I really enjoyed this conversation. Thanks very much for taking the time. Me too. Thank you very much for the invitation. That's okay. Um, So that's it for another episode of Days of Futures Past. Uh, I will put all the uh, links to Beth uh, and her work in the show notes uh, that will accompany this podcast. Uh, Please join me next time uh, where I'll speak to another guest about what inspired them as children, uh, the current topic uh, of the day, and uh, see you next time. This is Days of Futures Past signing off when we'll once again peel back the curtain on more lost futures. Stay tuned, and remember, the future may be here, but the past never fades. Until next time. Days of Futures Past was brought to you by Theo Priestley, keynote speaker, author, and retrofuturist. If you'd like to appear as a guest and reminisce about futures gone by, get in touch. I've been your radio host, Andrew Helbig. Goodbye for now.